With a weekend like this, you can greet your neighbor by saying, you know, either male or female, you're a brother or a sister, with a different mother but the same father. <laughs> Welcome. We're brothers, sisters. We got same papa, same papa. And our elder brother, Jesus, makes us all loved. Ah, well, come on in, have a seat. I'm going to share for a few minutes. Probably, yeah, just a few minutes. I want to talk about how you or I can, through our own personal encounters with God, come alive in our calling and inheritance and all that, that comes. The beautiful thing, um, if you read and uh, take any scripture, but this is, if you think of this as a script, something that you get to play act. Play act is a bad word and it means like it's not real, but it's often you have to give yourself permission to be enter into something that in your mind's telling you there's no way this applies to me it's far my life is so far removed from it i don't think it could ever be me so i've got to work on my stuff here get this thing all squared away then i'll step into something more uh, lofty it's just that's the same rationale that we all practiced before we got saved you know i want to get my life together and then i'll get i'll give my life to jesus it doesn't work but if you give your life to jesus and then accept the words he speaks often what you find is that faith is all he was looking for because God doesn't need me to become something for him to do something. He just needs me to believe what he did with his son and I can become everything his son is. So uh, for me, I've had a, a super journey. When I go into this, in to be with the Lord every day, I'll enter into his presence. I'll enter through the blood. I know I'm there by the justification of Jesus. I'll start to fellowship in his word, and then presence and promise begin to merge, and soon I'm in much more than words. I'm in sight and sound, movement. Uh, creation comes alive. I start hearing this, the flowers sing and the leaves come alive. The whole world's really coming alive, especially because we're in spring. And um, I'll come home sometimes if I've had a long time away with the Lord, and I'll talk to him. I say, yeah, I was listening to the bees, and I was watching the leaves. You know, the the trees of the field will clap their hands. You know, they, it, it's not just supposed to be a metaphor. It's, they actually are in response. And if you can begin to catch, touch the glory of God, all that is of creation is still surrendering to the glory of God. You start to become aware of that. But that can go funny fast if you don't know this really well. And if this isn't, and this is where God always wants to take you back to and awaken. And it's like a script. So if you go with me, I'm going to read just Psalm 45, a few verses. And I think what I'd like to do to you is give you some uh, tools in this short half hour, how you can explore your inheritance. The thing about Ephesians and all the New Testament, you will find that your whole future and your whole identity is in Christ. Christ through my believing, he has made me a co-heir, joint heir, as I suffer and, and follow with him. But inside that, day I, the day Jesus was revealed in me, you immediately begin to be pointed backwards to that this was something already decided before you made the decision. So like when Paul said, uh, you know, when in Galatians 1, he talks about that who he was and who he was trying to be, which was a very zealot religious Jew. But when it pleased the Father who had separated me from my mother's womb to preach Christ to the Gentiles, revealed his Son in me. So the decision of Paul's future had already been decided and initiated at the separating of his mother's womb. But he was in the wrong direction. That's why when Jesus meets him in the glory, he says, why are you kicking against the goads? It's difficult. You're going against what I've created. I called you to. So in Paul's salvation, he came to know who the Lord is is and what did the Lord want him to do and that moment began to become forever discovery I, I've been noting that and I think you'll you can do the same if you go back to your beginning point with Jesus in that beginning point is the entire script of your life 
in a seed form. You may not fully see it in its, all its nuances, but, sh but, in the, in the comple but as you have um, traveled and you've met disappointment, and de death and discouragement and confusion, even with all of that, all those entry points of, of encounters open the door for a greater explanation of what you heard on that first day that you met Jesus. And you can see that in Paul's life because he, he's the one person we get to hear him share his testimony of meeting Jesus. We see it in Acts 9. We hear it again, I think, Acts 23. And then he repeats it to King Agrippa in Acts 26. And it's a maturing discovery it, in that he can clearly dis delineate what it was, why it was, what was the purpose, and so can you. And one of the things that I think happens is that we don't know how to take the things that have been given us and let them really come alive in us. And if they can really come alive, there is actually no limit. God, there is no, when you go to fellowship with the Lord, there is no like, okay, you better behave and be quiet and don't think too highly of yourself and quiet yourself. God is a super, he, 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 well, first off, in his presence is joy. Whenever you enter his presence, life comes. And he always talks about things that don't exist as though they already do. So we're talking about an expansive vocabulary Father has. And the capacity to take us far beyond where we could possibly go in a lifetime. I mean, Abram was so loved by God and became Abraham because he actually just journeyed with God in the Spirit. He's so far that he saw Jesus. Jesus in John 8 says that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and did see it. So Abraham wasn't limited by the fact that he wasn't allowed to have any possession except a gravesite. And what would have, might have looked like as a kind of a limited life, he, it was an unlimited life. First thing happens after he cuts covenant with Abraham, he puts him into a uh, sleep and then he into a trance and then he gives him a prophecy that goes 400 plus years. Can you imagine getting a prophecy that was speaking 400 years from now? See, most of us, our eschatology won't even allow that. <laughs> Jesus has got to come back in the next three years or whatever. But God is launching. So, so I, one time in, when I was writing the book, Saved Your Seat, I was having a conversation with the Lord, and I said, Lord, why? Or no, he actually had a conversation with me. He asked me the question. He said, why did I love Abraham so much? I said, obviously, I don't know, but you do. So, And he said, because most men will listen to me for a season. And then because the, the world they live in cannot collect, cannot become what I'm saying, or they, if there's a... There's a, a chasm that builds, you know, their, their, their reality may not change or it may go worse. And here I'm wanting to speak of things that I'm doing and who I'm, what they're becoming. And they get to a place that they put a demand on me to perform what I've already said. So they shut me down from talking. But Abraham never stopped me from talking. I could go as far as I want. I could speak of all that I wanted to do. I could ask of him to follow me in an extraordinary fashion. I could take his son that he was about to kill, receive it as being a sacrifice, prophesy through this act, I would have dominion over all of the enemies and, and open a door of possession. And he just kept listening. So the, the thing about prayer is so much about listening with your mouth, <laughs> using your tongue. To paint a picture. So, Father, uh, now that I've got everybody lost, <laughs> would you be so generous by your Spirit, Holy Spirit, who knows everyone? Paul prayed a prayer that because of the vastness of the gospel, that there would be given a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the f complete discernment of who you are, God, and Jesus. And that within each of us, the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened so we could know what is the hope of the calling, your calling us forth and our responding, and what is the surpassing greatness, glorious, beyond riches 
of glory, of your inheritance. Father, we've also recognized that we all come from a path and we're on a path and we're into a future. But also you have a path and we are your future and we're your inheritance. So Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you are the power source that makes all of this capable. And the journey always goes from revelation to death to resurrection. So wherever we are in the, the moment of time, in the season of life, you know, we just give you permission, Holy Spirit, to sit inside of us and begin to speak within us and point to us Jesus. Point Jesus to us. Point us in Jesus. Awaken where we are responding or what Jesus is doing and let us hear your voice so that we might um, begin to re-engage the conversation. If there's any place we're stuck or stopped, you are the one that loves to come alongside and converse. Lord, I pray right now that by the end of this little short time that there will begin a renewed conversation in every life within the journey and enjoying the discovery. And I thank you for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 45, I remember once asking the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm going to, for, for, for the rest of my eternity, I'm going to be discovering who you are. And that is going to be so cool. I'll never stop discovering you. And that's going to make me so happy. And he said, you know what's going to make me so happy? I said, what? He said, I am going to enjoy what you become by discovering me. You're going to be just as much of a discovery for me because you will become what you discover. So I am going to get to be at awe at what you become, just as you are at awe when you discover what I've done. See, this is a dance. It was never meant to be, tell me what to do and I go do it. It was always meant to let me see who you are so I can become who you are. And we are becoming one. We are one. We're inseparable. Father can't separate you from Jesus anymore. He's just the firstborn of many brethren. So, now here's the good news. In Jesus' resurrection, it starts with a voice of the Father saying, Today I have begotten you. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So that calling sonship out of death started a new race of people called the new creation. Spirit, a, new, a, a species called the redeemed. Uh, out of every tongue, tribe, people, nation. So we've been pulled out of every place, but we have now become one new man. And it all began with God saying, Jesus, you're my son. Today I've begotten you. Not at Bethlehem, but out of the, out of, out of the death that he had su submitted himself to, and he comes forth. Jesus said in John 6 that there's going to come a day when the dead will hear my voice, and everyone who hears my voice will live. Then he goes on and says, there'll come a day that everyone who's in the grave will hear my voice and they will come out of the grave and live to judgment. So there's obviously a, t a double, double experience. There's the awakening moment, which is like Paul on his way to Tar Damascus to arrest Christians and, he re and he's confronted in glory. Glory is where, where calling comes forth. Inheritance is spoken of. It's everything about your life is hidden in Christ in glory. And in glory is where we behold things that we couldn't see if we try to sort it out in the natural world. The horrific journey that I've been through, the terrible disappointments, the confusion, the chaos, the things won't reconcile. All of that is the ashes that the Lord takes and brings forth the beauty out of. He doesn't displace the ashes. He actually metamorphoses the ashes. In the Hebrew, the word for ash and the word for beauty in Isaiah 61 are the exact same three letters just reorganized. So God could take anything of our life, just reorganize it a little bit, and it's beautiful. <laughs> okay. So Psalm 45, my heart over is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men, and grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. What I do, because, and it's, it's, is that or when you go to be with the Lord, 
not to die, but to be with him intentionally. Because I wake up just like everybody wakes up. I wake up sometimes happy, sometimes sad. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed. Sometimes life is more than I want to face, and it's nothing I want to do. So all of that is just happens to be because the clock rings, time starts, grandkids have to be watched, whatever. But when I go to be with the Lord, to be in present with him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to converse and have conversation, then my life calibrates in, back inside eternity and joy and peace and righteousness and all that floods in if I can allow it, if I can not be limited to trying to sort the day out, but just know the day is something I, he made and I get to rejoice in it. A lot of our struggles are that we're trying to change the thing we just should be walking through. I read this thing, Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep walking. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that. Don't stop. I go through the valley of shadow of death. I'm not living here. I'm going through it. So when the psalmist would, would come, he says, I've got something and I want to release it. What, what you carry already that is the most beautiful uh, substance in the spirit are the promises God has made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. That's a promise. When you call something that doesn't exist as though it did, you are self-committing yourself to complete something. And that's how God speaks. And in fact... As you take the time, you'll get all the permission you need to believe the Bible, to be fully yours by just understanding that every part of who God is is communicated by a promise. If he wants to teach you something about himself, he makes a promise to you about something he wants to do. We think, oh boy, he's going to do something. He's thinking, oh boy, I'm going to put my nature in you. We think, oh boy, this is going to change everything that I'm going through. He goes, oh boy, I'm going to free you from everything you're going through. We think, oh boy, no longer am I going to be subject to this stuff. And he goes, oh, you're not because you're going to carry my nature. You're going to live in my abundance. You're going to live in a new place. So God has an objective greater than the literal completion of any promise. You're going to get married. You're going to have children. You're going to touch the world. You're going to have money. You're not going to have money. We don't ever hear that promise. <laughs> Make sure... But, but whatever he's asking, speaking of us, it comes with, it's seed, it's sperm, same, right? And so we, we, we and, if, and God is just like all, all intimacy, it comes with ecstasy. It comes with, it comes with, ah, I'm loving the presence. I'm loving the, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the moment. And then he speaks and the seed is pressed inside my spirit womb and I conceive and it will take over my life just like all pregnancy. And I will sometimes regret that I ever heard those words or ever said yes to those words. But rather than, see, for I spent so much of my life schizophrenic because I was trying to bring about what I heard into the natural or I was wishing I'd never heard what I heard because what it had caused to happen to me in the natural world. Do you know what I mean? And, you, so, and then you're trying to think that if you re reorganize the way you did things, it might not have turned out the way it did. But then I discovered that my promises were my confession of hope. And they were to be my, what I brought to my high priest Jesus to celebrate Father and love and worship inside of the presence of God. And that my confession of hope was actually the intercession Jesus was praying. And I was hearing, overhearing his prayers, which he was now personalizing them as something he was going to do in my life. And he was standing before the Father and the, as a high priest in the throne of grace saying, hey, this is all going to happen because this was already happened when we started this whole time thing in motion. Before the foundation of the world, we already determined this to be everything. This is when Steve would be born, what he would be separated from his mother's womb. We also knew him before time began. We also set limits on when he, the boundaries of his discovery so he could come into the fullness of what we had. And so you can, you can step into eternity. You can step into comfortability in conflicts of, the, of space and time because... I trust me, God has so much more to promise you than he could possibly fulfill in a lifetime. 
I mean, wouldn't he want it? He, he, if all he has to do that he says is for this lifetime, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, we should be pitied more than most men. Because you're just not going, there's just no, there's not enough time to complete what he's saying. In fact, the whole Hebrews 11 is we're seeking a city whose builder and maker of God. And if we were seeking something here, we would have opportunity to plant our roots here, but we're pursuing something that's, that's a promise, and God, therefore, is not ashamed to call us his children. And it's just, we have dual citizenship, and we're le releasing this earthly citizenship to engage more fully in our heavenly citizenship. And the more we learn how to live here, the more we discover who we really are. So my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. But I wake up just like you with the same day you have. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm not overwhelmed. But I have a script. And, and the personal script, I have a characters that I can refer to. They're the one, that's all what you yeah, highlight. That's all the things you had moments where seeds were sown and imagery was planted and promise was made. That's who you are. That's who you're known by in heaven. That's what you carry. That's, that's what you're recognized. That's what causes your, the baby to leap in your womb when you hear like faith. So when I go to enter into presence, which is an immediate thing, it's through justification, it's through Jesus, it's through, thank you, I accept what you accomplished, I accept the place that I'm in, and now here in this place I relate to you. And how do I relate to you is through, my, your, through Jesus, my Lord, my high priest, but I also relate to you with the words of promise you've made to me. Because in heaven, the conversation is only about Jesus. It's all about the lamb. It's all about what he's accomplished. And it's all about us in the lamb and all that we're becoming. And if we follow this, if we follow the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible, we see that it's all about a marriage coming and a new Jerusalem and a, and, and a, and a separation from the the harlot to the, to the bride. And it's just so, we're just in this divine romance, this, this glorious drama, and we're just participating. So when the psalmist said, okay, my heart is like, uh, tongue is the pen of a ready writer, and I'm going to recite my, my, my uh, I'm going to recite my composition concerning the king, you do have a composition. You have promises God made. Now, life may tell you that it's not working, but God's word promises you that it will work. So what you'll find is in his presence, the greatest celebration you'll feel in heaven is when you say to God what he said to you. That's all a confession is, is the reciting back what you heard. But, now you're, uh, but by your reciting back what you heard, you're, uh, you're acknowledging the author of your story has written it correctly. And you're giving him, you're giving him joy, you're giving him, you're ascribing to him ability. Abraham, when it came time for Isaac to be born, the only, the only dynamic that really came to play by that time was that he was fully convinced that whatever God said he would do without him, didn't need him. He just said, yes, and I accept it. I'll go through, which if you follow his life, that was a crazy year. But when he, he didn't have to worry about what he was doing because it was all about what, not only did God promise this, but now that he's saying it's time for performance, he's able to perform it. So what, when, when I come, my heart is full. My, my emotions might not be, my soul might not be, but I have promise and I have a place of, rev, of enjoyment. I begin to describe and I begin to recite and you begin to tell who Jesus is. If you, you don't know who saved you. I mean, this, there's just one man that's worth worshiping. And he is glorious Jesus. And whenever you worship him, you are actually activating who you are becoming. You will be in Christ for eternity. You will know in that day that I, Jesus said, I'm in the Father and you're in me and I'm in you. You, you are actually releasing your future again. We get stuck in our stuff, and we can't get into our eternal position of joy. So if, if I bring my sound 
that he is personally writing. This is my, these are my promises he's making. And I have the courage in heaven to tell Father, I heard you say these things. I, Holy Spirit, you reminded me of this just the other day. Oh, this scripture's coming to my mind. Wow, this is who you are. This is what you're doing. This is what you've said. It's all about what you say. It's all about your ability to do. I just glorify you for who you are and what you're promising. You, you come alive because you are actually ascribing to Jesus who you are. You see, if we try to tell Jesus who we are, we're pretty much a bore. Because either we want to complain or accuse or fuss over stuff or tell him what he ought to be doing. But if we tell him who he is, he applauds that direction and next thing you know, he's prophesying over us. So Psalm 45 begins with, I'm going to start to talk about who Jesus is. So, and I'll give you two really practical things I, you could take home and practice this in a moment. But let me say this, because it's really important. If you begin in praise, you'll end in prophecy. God doesn't know how to stop from the, this is where it is, to this is where it'll be. See, because he already knows who you, he made you to be. You're going to become who he made you to be. That means you already are in him what you're becoming to you. So he loves to talk about more stuff. Psalm 45 is one of the Psalms that once he starts talking about this glorious king, and I want you to, the, 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 for me, descriptive language is such a limer, uh, 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 illuminator. Adjectives. You all remember an adjective? An adjective describes a noun. God is the big noun. Adjective described the big noun creates a better emotional picture, depiction of the noun. So to find ways to describe, you ride triumphantly in my life. You are glorious in the way you will work. You are faithful beyond the sun that rises at its appointed time. You are more... Uh, per- you're more, uh, what you say will happen as you say it, as far as time will go, because you are faithful. You're using descriptions to keep describing, and then you can get the adverbs to try to get the description to the verb, right? So, am I right? I'm, I, I, would di- I ignored English when I was growing up. <laughs> Wish I hadn't, but... So dis- <clears throat> finding the descriptions will then lead you into prophecy. By verse 6 of Psalm 45, he is stating, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, the scepter of righteousness. Is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. That gets in Hebrews 1. There's some things that you pray will show up somewhere in the future as the word of God, so to speak. We're not canonizing the new Bible. I'm not saying that. But things that you hear that you say are God's words. And therefore, they have eternal significance. And they will be later used to reference you back to your future. You'll come through a crisis in life. The Holy Spirit will remind you of something you prayed, an experience that you had, a something you saw that you had described vividly one time, but you didn't understand its significance. Now Holy Spirit brings you back out of your crises and points to that experience, that encounter, that word, that vision. That's what he's doing right here. Psalm 45, later now is used to, signi- to identify the resurrected Christ in his new role. And so shall it be for you. Everything in Scripture. Because it's all about Jesus, and therefore it's all about us. But it's not, it's for us. But it's not ours without Christ. So the discovery of revelation is, difficult, is, is a troublesome. And there goes my one more drink. 
problem about revelation is it demands death. It requires a sacrifice, and you are it. You will have to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Your soul will freak out. Your soul likes the idea of dominion, hates the idea of dying. Likes the idea of rest, hates the idea of submission. Doesn't like the idea of rain, loves reigning, but doesn't like to suffer with. So to learn to live under the voice of what you've heard, you have to learn to walk with the voice through whatever it is you're walking through and not disconnect from the voice. That's all Jesus learned as a, as a son on the earth, is how to live under the voice of his Father in all settings and not disconnect from the voice of the Father, which is what is called obedience. To stay in, uh, in union with the voice of the Father. So we learn to say, God, you're faithful in the middle of an unfaithful moment. You're good when evil has just fallen, befallen us. Your joy is ever available when we find ourselves in deep sorrow. Then Father says to us, rejoice when we want to be depressed. He says, stand up and walk when we want to retreat. So you see, it's, a, it's all it is is this beautiful conversation. You're hearing God, you receive it. It causes you to experience things that some are wonderful, some are awful, but it stays constant because if we deny Jesus, he shuts down. He won't come and agree with us because he can't deny himself. The relationship between father and son is so inseparable that if we get out of sync with Jesus' words over us, Jesus just kind of waits till we want to return. We don't return by performance. We return by Humility, acceptance, wow, you're right. I don't want to have a fight with you. You're wonderful. You're true. Praise and humility. Praise opens the door. Prophecy. Prophecy opens the door to, to having a better connection as we walk through the present. Exodus 15, Ray brought up, which is the song of Moses. It's the only song recorded in the, in the Bible that makes it into the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation 15, when they, when they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The song starts off with declaring the victory they just experienced. Always declare the victories you've experienced. Always rehearse. Rehearse. The, you see, your testimony of Jesus is everything you experience of Jesus, everything you see of Jesus, everything you hear of Jesus. It's everything of your interaction with eternity in Christ, through Christ, with Christ in the Bible, by the Holy Spirit. And the more you rehearse it, the more you praise God for it, the more you engage, the more you imagine, the more you experience, the more you carry the testimony of Jesus. And the persecution that John was in the Isle of Patmos for was because he, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. When he's told, don't be worshiping an angel because I'm here to serve you and all of those who hold the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is your future. It's your past. It's your present. It, 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 is, it is your identity, your, your inheritance, your calling. Everything the Father dreamed of is found in Christ and completed in Christ. So this place, but if you forget your song, you lose your song, you lose your victory. Because if you read Exodus 15, they got off talking about all of the nations they would drive out, the temple they would build. They talk about the heart of all the enemies of the land melting. They talk about Moab shaking and, his, and everybody passing through un, un, unhindered. And instead, when they get and find the giants, they all freak out. Because, I mean, what's going to happen is you will perceive what you cannot hold. You will see beyond what you can do. You will, you, will be, you will be told you are what you are not yet. Because God doesn't know how to tell you what you aren't. He's always telling you what you are to be, as though you are. So you will launch into, into adventures you will retreat from. You will, you will commit yourself to a journey that you can't complete. You'll start something and freak out. And then the devil will come and condemn you and say you have no right to it, but it means nothing. It's just practice. 
It's just exercise. It's learning your part. This is a beautiful movie. Jesus is the star. Father is the producer, director. Holy Spirit, he's sound effects. I don't know. We're the, you're the co-star. You get a leading role next to Jesus, interfacing with Jesus, following Jesus' life. It's so beautiful. So every disappointment is meant to be just resubmitted, both to discover how faithful God is and how unfaithful I am. So I get less and less responsibility, and he gets more and more ability. So you really get free. You, because it's no longer about, I got to do it right this right time because I might get fired. You can't get fired. You're embedded in the body. You're made to be a member. You're, 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 we're one. So here's the two practical things because Ray's supposed to get up. A lot of times we practice the Bible as either something we're like trying to, a code book, we're uh, memorizing scriptures, we're getting promises to get us out of a problem rather than it's a divine transformation process. So, you remember when you're in high school and you had to study about a subject you didn't know? Now, when I was in high school, we didn't have the internet. We couldn't Google, we had to go to an encyclopedia. And do you remember your teachers, what they'd always say to you? They'd say, now, I want you to go to these sources for your information, but when you write your paper, what do I want you to do? I want you to write it in your own words. Remember, and you're, those teachers, somehow they all had a copy of your home encyclopedia. And you'd go one of those late nights and just write it out just exactly as the encyclopedia did. Which we should have known at 12, 14, or 17 that we don't have the language of the World Book Encyclopedia. But push comes to shove, you do what you got to do. And then they'd write back, need to do it in your own words, redo. One, one of the most powerful ways to awaken Scripture inside of you is to put it into your own words. Take a verse that Papa says, I'm, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, this is who you are, this is what you're becoming. Learn it, but then rehearse it with your own language. Describe it in, in, in current vernacular. Use different uh, noun descriptions, adjectives, uh, because when you do that, you're hearing yourself. You're meditating, is what we're doing. You're mulling. You're you're, you're pondering. You're perceiving. And then another thing, even before that, and in the midst of that, is linger, linger in the word. I don't have an objective when I go to pray. I have no prayer list that I'm supposed to pray through. I just have an encounter I'm going to have. And I'm going to have a conversation with the Father. And I don't know exactly where he will, will that conversation will go. But I'll start to get a direction. And I'll try to move and meander in that. When I find myself being at the burning bush moment, that's when I really want to, I really want to take it all in. So you slow down. And you... And you, and you imagine, like that, what I said in Psalm 45, we'll just use that one verse. Uh, he starts off by, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. And you have to stop. What does that mean? You are fair. You hold a dignity. You hold a beauty. Uh, you can go to your concordance real quick. What is fair in the Hebrew? That's sometimes a real discovery point. Your grace is poured upon your lips. You speak grace. Grace comes in your speech. Grace comes pouring out in your words. I therefore experience grace as I read your word. And I feel the strength of God taking me into the impossible. You speak of things that are beyond my connectivity in my mind, but yet my heart says yes, and I say yes. And the beautiful thing is that when your tongue becomes the pen, you start to write your story long before your brain can catch up with what it really is meaning. And while your brain and your soul is suffering, you don't have to live stuck there. You can read 
turn to the sound and recount the words in the mighty acts, the next thing you know, you're back there. It's, and it is, it is so unlimited. It should be illegal. It actually is. The religious world will not allow you to do these things. To explore the realm of Holy Spirit and the heavenly realm and the voice of God and the Holy Spirit and the expansiveness to go into the realms that God has made possible. If you are risen with Christ, seek those things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That tells you right now what you're looking. We're going to start in the throne room. Discover the throne room. Well, I've never seen the throne room. Revelation 4 and 5. You'll, there's the throne room. That's a pretty good place. Ezekiel 1, if you want to see the mobile throne room. What do the colors mean? What are the sounds, the thunders, the lightnings? What are the four living you know, creatures? And why, why, a, why a lion? And why seven spirits? Oops, there it goes. I can't go there. So only one Holy Spirit. See there, your brain's going to get challenged. And you go and you say, well, if the Bible says there's seven f flames as fire, which are the seven spirits of God, I guess Holy Spirit can show up seven different beautiful ways. You have, to, you, have to, you have to surrender dogma, tradition, limitations. And then when it, he comes and speaks to you in your context of your story, and you're going, there's no way. I know me. I know where I'm coming from, and I know what's happened to me, and I know how much time I have left. There's no way. And you have to, like Abraham, you have to go, you know what? When God met Abraham and says, time for Isaac, you know what his response was? Let Ishmael stand before you. In other words, I'm cool with whatever, but I don't really want to do another one of these. <laughs> I mean, let's just, let's just perfect this to Ishmael. And the Lord says, Ishmael will be great, but what I'm going to do is now through you, and I'm changing your name. And what an elastic person, a fluid person. If he'd been concrete, if he'd been so concrete, he would have to say, no, 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 I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there now. I'm not going to go there and forget the circumcision idea. I am not going there. But he just, okay. So that's all God has created. You are going to be more fluid in the last parts of your life than you ever were when you were a child. That's why our childlikeness is the beautiful part of the wonder. And then if he was concrete, when he was on the Mount Moriah with a knife over his son, and the Lord said, stop, you don't have to do it. He said, no, I have to do it because I have to finish what God said. And that would have just been kind of a weird, just been weird. Do you understand? It's just been weird because later the devil was going to copy that kind of identity. they take your son and throw him to the fire, and there would be the, the precedent set. So God is a genius. He knows how to take you to a place where he has sex, ex, accepts your obedience as complete without it getting so messy that you have to be stupid. Do you, does that make sense? He can help you pluck out your eye without plucking your eye out. Show you how to cut off your hand without cutting it off. He can get you to the, the essence of what he's saying without you having to go off into a legalistic concrete. Hardest thing with I find with Believers, is they're too concrete. They're rigid. We're stuck in our past. We're stuck in our problems. We're stuck in our situation. We're stuck in our outcome. And we can't just let it go. So the first thing I have to do every day is forgive and let go. To God, you don't owe me anything. I'd like to explore everything. You don't have to do anything to be faithful because you are faithful by nature. I don't have you, you don't need to prove to me for me to believe you. I want to hear what you want to say. I want to celebrate what you're saying. And I want to experience it now in my spirit, in my emotions, in my soul. I want to feel you, know you. I want to be known by you. And if, when, that, when you give God that permission, you have no idea how far he can go with a conversation and how beautiful the conversation gets. Take time to pause, to Ponder the word. When you get that burning bush, that moment where Holy Spirit's pointing, I'd like to show you something. Just be there. When you want to give it back to the Lord, when I'm hearing you say, look for your own language. And then when you're trying to assimilate what you're saying, look for synonyms. 
Synonym is another way, another word for saying the same thing. In his presence through faith in Jesus, what he accomplished, and therefore it's, it is accessible. Now I carry a confession of hope, which is all about promise yet to be fulfilled, but it has already been done. And this language of confession of hope is the intercession of Jesus. And I am bringing it to the Lord, acknowledging he is so, and this is what he said, and I thank you for what that means, and it will become this to do that. And I'm experiencing as far as that will take me. And in that, it's like you take a concordia, you just open it up, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's so big, and then the Holy Spirit says, oh, come here, I want to show you this little thing right over there. And somehow the scroll just stays open, and you go over there, and you touch that. And you peer, and it goes further and further and further in, and then you he says, here, take this. I'd like to show you something now. And you touch that, and somehow this expanse stays in place. And they go higher and higher and higher and higher. And there you are in the pinnacle of time and creation and redemption and future. And then he says, okay, let's start in re-expanding this. Have you ever, right? Revelation, scroll, seven seals. Pop one open. Pop another one open. Pop another one. Get to the seven seals. Oh, here comes trumpets. Poop a doo doo. Poop a doo doo. I mean, just or get to the last trumpet. Oh, here comes the bowls. Between the bowls and the trumpets. Oh, we had some thunders, but we can't write about that because that'd be too much to, for everybody to hear. Just keep that one sealed. So, one twenty-five percent of the revelation of Jesus was sealed. That's why Ray's so good about loud no noise. Let the sound come alive. So, Father. I ask you, as we are here in sight of sound and of your movement and revival and all of the history of your beauty that so awakens our humanity and our journey, that you also would come with us and call us to come away with you. In our past retreats and confusion and the places of offense and betrayal and we don't know what to make of this. These could fall off. Your voice come alive. And we could journey with you again in a new way. Father, I thank you that there would become for all of us such an identification in Christ and such personal identification in our inheritance and calling in Christ through promise and words, your scriptures and your Holy Spirit language, that our journey there would be of of such magnitude of discovery and such enjoyment. Lord, I pray that for everyone here, we would enter into a whole new season of glorifying Christ, enjoying Christ, bringing glory to Christ, and being enjoyed by God. Lord, do it for your glory, because you can. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll take, yeah, thank you. We'll take five minutes and be right back. And then we'll start without music. You'll hear Ray's booming voice, so you'll know it's time to be here. Thank you so much.